Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Mind Your Own Family Business Podcast. Uh, I'm Dan Binkin with the University of Northern Iowa's Family Business Forum. Uh, we're honored and excited today to have Jason Andriga with us. He's the current president and CEO at Vermeer Corporation here in Pella, Iowa. Um, many of you will recognize the Vermeer Corporation name, and I think most of us would agree that uh, the, Ver the Vermeer family is certainly uh the one we lift up is probably the gold standard when it comes to family transitions, family success, um, managing the, the three circles, so to speak, of, of family leadership, ownership, and uh, and working in the business. Uh, Jason, we're just excited that you could do this with us today. We're here in your grandfather's home. You know, I look over your shoulder across the street. I can I can see the Vermeer campus and, and the amazing uh, corporation that, that your family has built now over the last 76 years. Um, again, we're just really grateful to have you here to share a little bit of your background, how you came into the business, uh, how you were nurtured in, in terms of your leadership development now with the company, and maybe even a little bit about how you now as a parent um, take that lens to for your own children and how you uh, maybe are developing and getting them exposed to the to, to the company and, and the opportunities. Um, so with that, uh, let's, let's get into some questions, but, um, so Jason, we're here in your grandparents' house, right? And I think you just told me that I'm sitting in your grandfather's chair. So I'm a little nervous right now. <laughs> um, but this is where everything started for your family company. Um, and I'm curious, you know, if you could share a little bit about what it was like growing up in a family company that, you know, when, at what point did you kind of realize that you were part of something that was maybe a little more unique than, than the typical, uh, com uh, I, uh, Iowa family from that standpoint. I often introduce myself with regards to working at Vermeer as I've been working at Vermeer for nearly 14 years or my whole life, depending on how you look at it. And, um, you know, it, it feels as though I've been involved with Vermeer from my earliest memories. So my grandfather's most iconic invention was the round hay baler. Yeah. He made that invention in the early 1970s and I was born in the mid 1970s. So some of my earliest memories were, you know, taking pictures on round bales of hay with my cousins. Um, so, you know, from my earliest memories, Vermeer was a big part of it and have my whole life been extremely proud of this company with my grandfather's name on the buildings and my grandfather's sure. name on the machines. And uh, I had a you know tremendous relationship with both of my grandparents, spent a lot of time with them. So the opportunity to you know continue my family's legacy of leadership from my grandfather, um, both my uncles um, worked in the company. My uncle Bob was CEO for many years, and then to you know be my mom's successor as CEO are you know that's very gratifying. To sure. In that leadership vein, you just mentioned. You know, I'm curious if there's any. Uh, specific memories you have of your grandparents, specifically probably your grandfather, that that might have shaped your own leadership style, like things that you picked up on from him, you know, even maybe when you were just a little youngster running around on hay bales type of thing. But my grandfather was very influential to me in a variety of ways. I decided to major in engineering when I built a cabin with my grandfather in Canada between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college. So he was influential to me to the point of even selecting my major because of um, that experience with him okay. and because of the aspiration and the expectation that I would eventually come to work for Vermeer. Sure. Um, but, you know, I, I would say the the kind of the overall life lessons that I learned from my grandfather that I definitely hope to uh, implement in my own leadership is integrity, number one. Mm -hmm. um, there was never any doubt in my mind that my grandfather always operated with the utmost integrity. Okay. And then secondly, a, a long-term vision. Sure. You know, I, I can't imagine my grandfather ever making a decision for to the benefit of the short term and to the detriment of the long term. I guess. Gotcha. So, you know, those are a couple things that um, in a variety of ways, personal um, business in, in every way in which he lived his life. He lived his life with integrity and he lived his life with. It sounds like you spent some time 
outside the company before he came back, if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, what kinds of, you know, what was that like as far as, was that a purposeful and uh, thing that you were doing to work somewhere else? Did you know that you would always come back to the company? Um, how did that play out for you as, a, as your career unfolded? My Uncle Bob and my mom showed a lot of foresight by when my cousins and I, my sister um, and I were in sort of junior high, high school, college age, uh, we developed a family employment policy. So those things that, that we would do before potentially starting a career at Vermeer. And I think that is a really important document for our family. Okay. I think it's uh, really a good thing for family businesses to consider, particularly as a family business is going from sort of the second generation to the third generation and, you know, all subsequent generations yep. after that, um, you know, probably not quite as critical when it when it's going from first generation to second sure. generation because, you know, so often, um, you know, the kids are involved from their earliest very memory close. in, in yep. you know, a very direct way way, yep. you know, first to a second generation. But um, for, for us, we had this family employment policy in place when I was in high school. And so it was it was just an expectation for me that I would do something before eventually coming back to work at Vermeer. And all of my thought process was based on that. Okay. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I decided I was going to major in engineering and uh, got an undergrad degree in mechanical engineering. And then started thinking, you know, what would be an interesting thing to do um, with an engineering degree before eventually coming back to work for Vermeer. And I'm a pilot and I've always been very uh, passionate about aviation. So okay. I thought I'd maybe do something with aviation. And then pretty quickly I, I pivoted toward being completely infatuated with space for a period of time. Okay. So I co-opted at Johnson Space Center as an undergrad. Oh, wow. And I went to MIT for a graduate school in aerospace engineering and worked for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which which is a NASA center as well for four years before coming to work for Vermeer. All right. So, so you're a rocket scientist. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, you know, within that's J good stuff. Within JPL or within NASA, I wouldn't call myself a rocket scientist, <laughs> but because I wasn't a propulsion guy. But yeah, according according to most people, I'm a rocket scientist. All right. For our standards here today, you definitely check that box. That's great. Um, how did CEO become maybe a position you thought you know that? that's where I want to, that's where I want to strive to get to, or that's where I want to direct my career toward. Was it something that, uh, you know, your uncle or your mother or, or somebody else, you know, how did that, um, come into play for you and your thought process and how did you shape your, your style to get there? For me, the aspiration of becoming CEO was, was always part of the mix. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm in my sixth role now at Vermeer. So I was in five previous roles before becoming the CEO and thoroughly enjoyed those previous roles. Um, you know, so, you know, to me, it was never as though I was just biding my time until I could become mm -hmm. CEO. I, I invested myself fully and, and thoroughly enjoyed and, um, you know, absolutely gave my best effort to every role that I had sure. for CEO. But, you know, always in, in my mind, I was hoping and aspiring to eventually be the CEO. And it was always my aspiration that I would have the opportunity to succeed my mother as CEO, um, to, you know, have a continuous line of Vermeer family mm -hmm. leadership within the organization. And, uh, you know, even before I came to Vermeer, um, one of our key directors who became our lead director, he was my mentor and, and still is, he's a close friend now, um, guy by the name of Lynn Horak. And, um, you know, I, I was very straightforward with him before coming to Vermeer and early in my career at Vermeer that that was my aspiration um, and, you know, very forthright with uh, the vice president of HR that, that that was my aspiration and and certainly that I didn't feel entitled to anything, sure. but that my desire was to earn that opportunity. And um, I was in, you know, five different positions over the span of a decade before becoming CEO. Okay. Were there things that that your family or the firm did 
you know, and I, I know we're on a much larger scale than some of our clients will be, but I'm um, just wondering, were there things that they might have done um, to help kind of with your development within the firm or um, specifically maybe from the family side that, you know, you could see as applying to other families or things that you're glad they did for you that, you know, you would encourage others? We have some really tremendous structure that, uh, you know, we really look at it as the three circles, the business circle, yeah. the ownership circle, the family circle. And, uh, you know, we, we have structures that have focuses in each of those different areas. So, you know, we have a tremendous ownership council and uh, we've had family councils in the past. And um, so, you know, I think we, we do the best we can to have the appropriate structures and, you um, I had a small group of people um, that included both internal resources and also members of our board that were extremely involved with, on a quarterly basis or even more often, um, you know, hearing from me as to how things were going and giving me advice and, you know, really helping to determine each of those five positions that I was in before becoming CEO. Oh, okay. So my first position was an engineering position, which made sense. That was my sure. background. And then that group was very instrumental in making the decision that my next stop should be an international experience. Okay. So for three years, I was responsible for our regional office in the Netherlands, which is responsible for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Okay. And that, that was to me, um, my most crucial development opportunity, um, in, in developing toward eventually the CEO role is um, the opportunity to be responsible for an entity and to you know work in a place where you know business culture is quite different than here. Sure. Um, so um, and you know that was definitely a combination of uh, my uncle was CEO at that point, um, my mom was co CEO, so that you know both of them were were involved in that from you know kind of a family perspective okay. providing. So there was a lot of intentionalness yeah, going uh, on. There was, there definitely was a lot of uh, you know intentional um, thought yep. in it. Yep. And uh, and uh, um, you know my my mom has you know been. Um, Tremendous for my whole life, frankly, in, in being very instrumental in, in my selecting to come work at Vermeer and, and my development through Vermeer. So uh, I had the opportunity to travel with my mom when I was in, you know, grade school, high school, college, um, and seeing Vermeer equipment working in customers' hands on um, some of the trips that I was with my mom on um, was definitely significant okay and what led me to come to Vermeer and led me to uh, continue to develop at Vermeer to, sure. get, to develop to your own passions yeah, absolutely oh uh, that's cool um, I know that you have kids right yeah um, and I, I don't know their ages but um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about you know what you're thinking now for them and and how you are kind of getting them exposed to the firm, getting them exposed to what it means to be part of a family company and, and getting, um, just, I guess, just getting them exposed to what, what the opportunities may or may not be making sure they don't feel in tramp myths or those kinds yeah. of things. How, how are you doing that? I never felt pressured to come to Vermeer. Really? Nope. Okay. I, I never felt pressured by my mom to come to Vermeer. I never felt pressured by my grandfather to come to Vermeer. Um, I, I definitely felt, you know, from both my parents and my grandfather that, you know, they would like to see me come to Vermeer, but in, in no way did I ever feel pressured. And, and frankly, when I was extremely enamored by space for a period of time. Um, you know, my, my mom and my grandfather thought that was great and, yeah. and they were very supportive of that. And if, and if I had decided to spend my entire career in aerospace, they would have supported it. Um, so, you know, right along those same lines, I have no intention to put any pressure on my kids to come work at Vermeer. I have three children and, you know, my, my hope is that as owners of this tremendous company, that they are pro they're proud of the company, that they have a desire for the best 
in the future for all Vermeer stakeholders sure. that, um, you know, they're concerned about um, the future of the company from the perspective of our team members, from the perspective of our customers, from the perspective of our dealers, and of course, from the perspective of the shareholders. Um, you know, that, that to me is what I intend to instill into my kids. And if their passions eventually lead them back to Vermeer, um, that'll be great. But if, if their passions and you know their backgrounds lead them in other directions, I'm gonna support that 100% and, and hope that they continue the pride of ownership that we've had sure. for 71 years and counting. Okay, that's cool. I appreciate that. Um, I, this is a little different question now, so we're gonna talk maybe about your outside board of directors. Um, I know you utilize an outside board of directors, and I'm, I'm curious, how does the combination of, of that along with, with family, because you have a very large, I would say, family of 70 plus folks who are shareholders, I think, in the company, right? All of your different relatives that are, that are tied to this. How, how did those things intermix, if at all, to guide your decision making? I'm very happy that we made the decision several years ago and, and really there is unanimous support among the shareholders for our plus one board. So um, we, we will always have at least one additional outside independent director in comparison to family directors. Okay. So currently we have five family members. Um, two of those are named positions. It's the CEO position, which, which I'm in, and the chair position that my mom is in. And then we have three additional shareholder directors, and those seats have four-year term limits okay. on them. And those three seats are recommended to the board by the ownership council. So the ownership council is responsible for developing the um, Bring onboarding and the, the procedures and um, the process by which people submit their name to be sure. considered and then go through the tasks that are determined by the ownership council and, and by the um, HR and governance mm -hmm. committees of the board um, to, to have the opportunity to serve on the board as a shareholder director. And then other than those five, we have currently six independent outside directors. And um, the, the insight and the um, you know, business wisdom that we get from those six independent directors is phenomenally valuable to me from a business perspective. And then I think also it provides a significant level of comfort to the family members and to the ownership council that, um, you know, there there is tremendous wise leadership and, and oversight provided by the board. Okay. All right. That's cool. I, I, I think, you know, as many family businesses as are listening to this, you know, I hope they really strongly consider having a board, an outside board just seems so integral to family harmony and, and those kinds of things as well. Um, a couple of questions now, thinking backwards, maybe a little bit of so here you are now as CEO. Um, are there any things that you would have told your younger self? Um, to do differently, knowing you would move into this role or maybe to speed up getting exposure to or anything like that or not necessarily? There's not a whole lot I would do different. Okay. You know, de definitely. I'm, I'm glad I, I spent as much time as I did outside the business. Yep. Um, there was a time when I was in graduate school at MIT and uh, was decided I didn't want to go on for a PhD and, you know, wasn't really enjoying the research that I was doing and considered going right to Vermeer after MIT. And I was newly married at the time. And, you know, my wife said, but you don't fulfill the family employment policy. And sure. I said, yes, I do. I, you know, I co opt for this amount of time and I'm, I'm a research <laughs> assistant at, at MIT. So that counts. And she's like, no, that doesn't count. You need to go work someplace full time first. And, you know, that, that was great advice. It's um, good to have that voice of yes, reason in your yes, life, isn't it? Yes. So, okay. you know, I, I'm, I'm glad I, I worked outside the business as, as long as I did. Um, when I was at J I went to business school at night for three years and um, you know that that also was was really important to me to you know recognize that I really was very intrigued by business mm -hmm. by the opportunity to go back to my family business sure so um, 
you know, there's there's probably little things I would change Not as, too much. as far as, you know, how I, how I allocated my time yep. in different roles. You know, I could, I could look at each of the different five roles I was in before CEO and think, you know, maybe I'd have spent a little bit more time in this area and a little less time in that area. But, but overall, from a broad perspective, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad with the choices I made from an educational perspective. I'm glad with the choices I made from uh, uh, working outside the company before coming into the company and, you know, really feel very strongly that, you know, working your way up through the company in an appropriate way is very important. Um, you know, I, I'm glad that I, I came in into the company in a role that I was totally qualified for yep. that my background led me directly into and and then and then I'm glad that that I was part of a variety of experiences you know that I, I didn't just stay in an engineering track sure but um, you know I got very broad expo exposure in my my other five positions before becoming CEO would you say that part of that you know it, it sounds to me like you know very few if any real like regrets or changes that you would make and i wonder if is some of that partly due to the fact that that your family is so intentional with planning and with uh having some roadmaps and and you know policies even if they're somewhat loose but it doesn't sound like they are to to be able to kind of help guide you along and and in in uh in that way so that you know, you're not just kind of free flowing, making it up as you go. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, and frankly, once again, I think it goes back to the foresight of the second generation, you know, my uncle Bob and my mom to, you know, start the process of, of a family employment policy. And, you know, we worked with outside resources. We worked with firms whose specialty is helping family firms. And, you know, they provided us a lot of great advice. Yep. Um, you know, I spent one-on-one -on -one time with those firms. They, they spent one-on-one -on -one time with, you know, my sister and each of my cousins and, uh, and then, you know, spent time with us as a group. And I do think that instilled the intentionality of, um, you know, not just kind of winging it, sure, but, but being, being very intentional about it and, and, you know, being sure about yep. it before, before actually embarking on it. You know, I, I certainly never came to Vermeer with the, with a thought, Oh, well, I'll just see how this goes. Sure. Um, it, you know, I, I felt pretty confident that Vermeer was the right choice for me before actually starting. That's it. That's awesome. Okay. okay. How about if you're thinking about other, so we, this will be listened to by a lot of next generation family members uh, across Iowa, you know, and, and beyond maybe, but um, as far as if you were to give advice to other next gens coming up in a company, um, you know, what kinds of things and would you be kind of telling them? And, and especially for those who are looking to one day probably take over at the top. Family businesses are tremendous opportunities for family members, but there are also a lot of cons to them. Um, you know, definitely um, you are under a spotlight more so than other people. Um, and, and so, you know, knowing that that is the case is important and being prepared for that to be the case is important. So I, I really think most fundamentally it comes down to is the type of work that the family business business does, does that at your core appeal to you? Yep. Does the type of work that you would be doing, do, does that inspire you? Does that um, make you excited to, you know, think about getting out of bed every day to do that? Um, you know, and if the answer to that is either no or, or I don't know, um, probably it's continue tough. to work outside the business until until you feel confident that the answer is either yes or I'm quite sure it's yes um, and and you know once once that's the case you know then um, you know family businesses are just tremendous opportunities and and I think they're um, they're valuable to all stakeholders um, you know I, I am convinced that our customers appreciate the long-term view that we have because we continue to be privately held and we continue to uh, mm -hmm. have family leadership in the company and and the team members that we have at Vermeer and and the shareholders when in thinking about the uh, the value of the company for them in the long term um, you know there there is a tremendous amount of value when when there are 
family members who are passionate. I, I often say this to our dealers that, you know, my number one desired pathway for our dealers that are that are family owned is that they would transition from one generation of passionate, engaged, talented family leadership to the next generation yep. of engaged, passionate, talented leadership. And if that can't, if that's not possible, then there's other options. Sure. But that's option A. And, um, you know, I, I do feel that that is the case for family businesses. You know, when you do have that next generation of passionate, talented leadership, that is the best choice. Um, that's option A for a family firm. Do you ever, do they ever ask, I'm sure they do, when, when they ask you for advice on how to bring their kids into those dealerships, you know, what kinds of things do you share that are probably, you know, firsthand for you a lot? Exposure to the business early is great, and and we do this at Premier with um, with our education group, which is part of the ownership council. is is trying to be as open and accommodating as we can possibly be to expose um, our now fourth generation yep. to you know the scope of Vermeer to um, the incredible impact of Vermeer, so that you know at a minimum, but this is a really important minimum, so that they are, you know, passionate, competent, future owners of the company. Sure. And, you know, if that then leads to someone to, you know, pursue a career in that company, great. Um, but yet making sure not to make people feel pressured because I feel very strongly that, you know, anybody that worked into, worked in a family business because they felt pressured to be in the family business. Yep that the, the company is not well served if, sure. if that's the case sure so it sounds like kind of like voting early and often <laughs> exposure here huh yeah okay. I, you know we our our education committee does um i think a, an excellent job of you know being very accommodating for um internships and summer experiences and um you know being exposed to the company via our annual family camp mm -hmm. um, that you know really allows people to develop the, the pride in the company and the understanding of, of the company, but yet in a, in a non-pressured way. Sure. As an educational way, yeah. huh? You know, but you know, how well the team rallied around that, how quickly we, first of all, the, the blessing that we had no serious injuries, no fatalities. Um, that's number one. And then, you know, beyond that, to be able to get our team back to work as quickly as we did, um, to communicate with our team as effectively as we did during that time, sure. to recover our production as quickly as we did, and, you know, to, to be in investing all of our insurance proceeds plus millions of dollars more into the rebuild so that, you know, we will, we are, we are turning a challenge into an opportunity. You know, we're, we're taking the opportunity um, to really allow us to be better because of the tornado and how we rebuild from it sure. than ever. So, you know, that that's what I wasn't planning on. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, the, probably the other two that to me are really important is to continue to leverage what to me is our number one core competency, um, which is designing and building innovative products for niche markets, yep. um, which, you know, that's not only in, the engineers that are involved in that, that's everybody here sure. that's involved in that. And then, um, you know, with time increasing the, uh, the international footprint okay. that we serve, though, those are important ones to me. Okay. Yeah. We haven't really touched on the tornado, but you know, earlier you said you're a rocket scientist. I said you're a rocket scientist and I'm wondering if you've become kind of a weather expert or at least a tornado expert now. Are you the tornado guy now? I, I hope not to ever gain any more expertise than what I already have. Okay. Sure. Okay. That's what we got for this i don't know jane you think you have anything else that we should i think you we might we might voice over some uh, uh mentions of the event coming up uh on the 30th and um well, we purposely tried to stay off of topics too that we knew we were going to co be covered yeah 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 we didn't want to so yeah sorry that. i'm not going to be here for that but no it's okay know, it's it's you know kind of as i alluded to before i i try to you know make a 
very clear distinction between, you know, my, my desire is, is to be responsible for the business. Yep. And, you know, I, I am thrilled that the ownership council is responsible for the family circle and the ownership circle. And, you know, obviously I'm involved as appropriate in both of those sure. circles, but, um, you know, really glad that it's our ownership council that's responsible. Takes for care it. of that. Yeah. Oh, cool. This was really awesome. Thank you for giving us some time today. Yeah. Happy to be part of it. <laughs>